And I'm going to start off just by telling you, I actually really struggled with this talk. Not so much on the cartilage mapping techniques, which I've been familiar with for the last 20 years or so, uh, but really focusing on the applications. And I took approach of not so much the scientists in me, but really the diagnostic radiologists, looking at how we can use some of these advanced techniques to, and apply them to our individual patients. So part of this talk, I'm going to kind of go through the thought process that I went through in preparing this talk, which I have to admit I just revised about two days ago because, I, like I say, I've been struggling with this uh, discussion of these applications. And then also talk a little bit about what we have with our current armamentarium to m make uh, accurate diagnosis of early cartilage injury. Just in terms of disclosure, I am a consultant for medical metrics. I help design a lot of um, protocols for evaluating cartilage repair and osteoarthritis. We have a large portfolio and palette of different types of techniques that we can use to begin to look at early cartilage damage. And we've kind of, although there are a spectrum of, of different types of tools that we have, we can cluster them into different categories focused on the different type of application in which they're frequently applied. We just heard an excellent talk about degemeric and its role in being able to look at early proteoglycan uh, loss within, our, within normal, otherwise normal healthy articular cartilage. Similar type of technique we have is T1 row, a potential advantage there is we don't have to administer extrinsic uh, contrast agents, and newer techniques gag cess, which have the potential of being perhaps more specific looking at uh, proteoglycan. Similarly, we have other techniques that focus more on the type 2 collagen matrix within articular cartilage. T2 mapping, uh, which is one that's pretty uh, much available now either as a works in progress or standard tool on most manufacturers. Magnetization transfer, uh, which was one of the early techniques people looked at for evaluating uh, collagen. And then we have other types of techniques that focus not so much on the composition of the articular cartilage, but on that ultramolecular structure of those. Again, T2 mapping, as I'll show, is very sensitive to the orientation and the organization of collagen, but we also have techniques such as ultra short TE, which allow us to probe that water population that's intimately involved with collagen and get information from collagen, and then diffusion type techniques where we can look at the anisotropy of water motion within articular cartilage to get back some structure on that uh, collagen matrix. So these techniques all have uh, similar strengths in that they're very sensitive to very early cartilage degeneration. And they, in this early, very early stage, they have some specificity as far as the underlying mechanism. The problem is, by the time the patients see us, the cartilage is already starting to break down on multiple pathways. It's no longer just a pure proteoglycan problem, or a collagen problem, or a structural problem. Those things happen simultaneously, synergistically. And so these techniques begin to lose their specificity when we start to apply them to our clinical patient population. An advantage is that they're objective. They give us numbers that we can t obtain back. We can then look at systematically look at ways to reduce uh, variation in those types of measurements. We can look for ways to reduce systematic variation between manufacturers. It allows us to pool data from large populations. So for large clinical trials, uh, it's very useful to have that objective information. The problem is as they become more and more sensitive, the reproducibility and the variability of those techniques becomes problematic. And we can look at ana you know, analysis uh, techniques that we have to try to correct for some of that problem with reproducibility. One of the strengths is that they're very sensitive and responsive to preclinical progression. So that early progression that we may see within a patient as they go from what we would classify as very normal cartilage to early compositional changes in that cartilage, these techniques have a nice linear response. But by the time they start to get to the point where we begin to have structure tissue breakdown, where most clinical patients are presenting, they no longer are linear. We will see, for example, with T2 mapping, increases in T2, decreases in T2, a marked heterogeneity in T2 within an area of structural damage. So they're no longer responsive measures. We can't use them to monitor the progression of disease once we get into that typical area of cartilage degeneration where most of our uh, patients are presenting. So the question I would have is, what is the value of these clinical applications of these cartilage mapping techniques? And I think if we try to go back and look at what is value, uh, I'm just going to show you a typical uh, case scenario. This is see an axial protonicity weighted fat suppressed image. I think we can all clearly see the superficial flap tear within the lateral facet of the patellar cartilage. We could do techniques and begin to put quantitative numbers on this, but what does the patient and the physician taking care of this patient really want to know? They want to know, well, is this causing my knee pain? 
You know, I like to run for exercise. Is running going to make this worse? Do I need to change my lifestyle? Is this going to lead to osteoarthritis? And for, is there an effective treatment for this technique? Well, this particular type of cartilage lesion, really only therapy is to go in and cut it off the unstable pregnant, a chondroplasty. Um, and the question I would have is, what cartilage mapping technique do you recommend to answer these patients' questions? There really aren't any. Um, we don't have a technique that's going to allow us to look at, the, put that cartilage lesion into clinical context. And as diagnostic radiologists, that's really our role. If we look at cartilage lesions as a structural correlate for pain, well, articular cartilage is never a direct source of pain. It's aneural, it's avascular, it doesn't generate pain. If it causes pain, it causes it through its indirect effect on other components of the joint. Uh, there was a large uh, study done by David Hunter and group uh, looking at structural correlates of pain as they relate to osteoarthritis. And you really find that there's two major drivers of pain in patients that have cartilage lesions. Uh, that's primarily a, an inflammatory response in which we elicit synovitis and relatively large joint effusions. And then there's a second uh, source of pain, which is the overloading of the subchondral bone plate, a more mechanical um, driver of pain in which we get bone marrow edema-like lesions underlying areas of focal uh, cartilage uh, abnormalities. But isolated chondral lesions in themselves have a very weak correlation and association with symptoms. So particularly in a joint that otherwise looks normal, when we find these incidental cartilage lesions, typically they're not a driver of pain. If we look at this last case, um, we see this cartilage lesion, but what the driver of pain was really more of a suprapatellar quadriceps uh, fat pad synovitis, which we get it's related to the same thing that's causing the cartilage problems. As the patient gets older, they begin to lose lubricin, they have more shear stress along the surface of the articular cartilage, um, they start to have problems with patellar maltracking, and the same type of mechanics are leading to irritation of that suprapatellar fat pad. And this patient does quite well, uh, just a little bit of ice after running. You know, maybe occasional non-inflammatory, but they don't need to have anything done with this cartilage lesion. The diagnosis of the cartilage lesion wasn't the problem. Putting it into clinical context is the real dilemma that clinical radiologists face. The other question this patient had is, will this lesion progress? Well, here's what this lesion looked like in 2008. Here's what it looked like in 2011. Here's what it looked like in 2015. Seven years, it hasn't changed a bit. I could show you other lesions very similar to this in which the cartilage over the lateral facet basically disappeared. So we have a very poor ability to be able to predict which one of these isolated chondral lesions is going to progress and which one's going to remain stable. If we look at longitudinal studies in large populations, there's a couple things that we can see. Generally, isolated cartilage lesions like this progress very slowly over time. And then they undergo an exponential rate of decay. And that typically happens when we begin to have radiographic osteoarthritis. So it's when we get to that stage where not the cartilage is degenerating, but the joint in total is degenerating, that we begin to see some of these progressions in cartilage loss. If we look at patellofemoral cartilage loss, things that tend to be associated with that are large fusion and advanced patellar cartilage loss. You lose a lot more tissue, the little bit of tissue that's left behind has to bear a larger amount of that biomechanical stress, can't withstand those uh, stresses, and begins to deteriorate very rapidly. In tibiofemoral cartilage loss, that bone marrow edema as a measure of overloading of that joint compartment uh, is a marker of progression, and meniscal extrusion, again related to a driver that's indicating we're getting rapid progression and overloading of joints on tissue that's unable to sustain and respond to those types of forces. So in general, isolated focal cartilage lesions have very uncertain significance. And our ability to predict which ones progress and which ones are not progress is not very good. And what we have to do is turn our attention away from looking at cartilage and begin to look at the joint in total. So a lot of times our understanding of what the hap is happening with cartilage is really dependent on looking at what else is happening within the joint and be able to look at some of the underlying driving mechanisms that's leading to joint degeneration. So is there clinical value in cartilage mapping? Well, I think for us to say yes to this, we have to address a couple questions. One, it has to provide information that is unique from that obtained from conventional MRI. If it's simply duplicating information that we already have, it's not really adding any additional value. Uh, to add value, these additional techniques must change diagnosis. That will provide some incremental value. Change clinical management. I think we saw a very nice example of that with the degeneric technique, where we're using degeneric not to really make the diagnosis of of um, 
whether the cartilage is damaged, but if the cartilage is normal such that it's worth the investment of putting in a large major surgical correction for hip preservation. I think that is certainly one area where there's a clearly a clinical tool for these types of techniques. And finally, the ultimate way of demonstrating value is we really have to show that these techniques change management in a way that changes treatment outcome. Long term, that's what's going to determine whether these techniques have value or not. So I'm going to focus now a little bit on conventional MRI techniques in the evaluation of early uh, cartilage injury. And we'll start off just with a brief overview of some cartilage composition and structure. All of the techniques that we have rely on the fact that cartilage is primarily water, about 75% water, and we're using this water as an extramolecular probe to begin to probe different comp uh, components of the extracellular matrix, most of which is type 2 collagen. We've heard about the proteoglycan and a small number of chondrocytes. But it points out the fact that none of these are chemical techniques. They are not specific techniques. We are manipulating the way we acquire information about water relaxation in order to probe different environments related to the collagen and proteoglycan. But ultimately, as these begin to break down, the specificity of those different relaxation mechanisms goes away. And ultimately, they begin to coalesce such that there's not a lot of difference between one of these techniques and the other with more advanced degeneration. That intrinsic type 2 um, composition and structure of that type 2 collagen matrix has a significant driver on the T2 of articular cartilage. And this is just a schematic showing the relationship of that collagen structure to the bone. If we look at the articular surface here and down at the bone, down near the bone, the cartilage uh, collagen structure has a radial orientation perpendicular to the bone cartilage interface. As we move out towards the surface, at the surface it's parallel with the articular surface. In the intermeaning area there's a transitional zone. So there's this highly anisotropic uh, orient organization of this collagen matrix that performs, uh, um, provides a mechanism for very efficient T2 relaxation. So where we have high levels of anisotropy, particularly down in the radial zone, we end up with very short T2. And it's the structural organization of this uh, collagen matrix that's a major driver of a lot of the information that we get from conventional MRI techniques. That collagen matrix also drives the pattern in which cartilage is injured. If we take, uh, here's an osteoconal fragment, these are from uh, Doug Goodwin at Dartmouth, we can hit those with a hammer and it will fracture along those collagen um, uh, leaves. Similarly with healthy cartilage, it will fracture along that normal collagen pathway. That collagen is organized that way because it responds to localized mechanical stress. This is a portion of cartilage from the central portion of the tibia. If we look at portions of the joint that are habitually loaded with compressive loading, they have a very large radial zone. You can see how these fibers are oriented perpendicular almost throughout the entire thickness of the articular cartilage. That's quite different from the articular cartilage that's out at the periphery of the joint. That cartilage is exposed more towards shear forces. In those cases, that collagen has a more oblique orientation, eventually helps to tie down and reduce some of the shear stress that's imposed on that osteochondral unit. So very different type of collagen matrix that's different within regional portions of the joint, primarily driven by the underlying and habitual mechanical loading that's occurring within that joint. If we take that same schematic, if we looked at the central portion of the weight bearing joint, we find that this has a very large radial zone, shown here dark, where we have the oriented parallel lines, a much thinner transitional zone, quite different from out of the peripheral cartilage, where we have a much shorter uh, radial zone and a much longer transitional zone where that, those fibers are oblique. And if we look at the normal, here's the coronal proton density. Uh, view of the joint, we can appreciate some of that intrinsic differences. If we look at the central portion of the joint, we see this thicker low signal intensity area. That's the larger radial zone within the pitchly loaded portion of the joint. It becomes much thinner with a thicker transitional zone out of the periphery of the joint. So that collagen matrix is showing its effect even in our routine conventional MRI sequences that we have. And we can use some of that information to begin to look for early cartilage injury. The important thing is that we recognize what is the normal variation and what are the drivers of that normal variation. Because one of the earliest changes that we see is that we have a heterogeneous increase in T2 within that cartilage due to damage of that underlying collagen matrix. So here we can see the normal variation uh, within the, the medial tibial cartilage. Here you see a much thicker uh, high signal intensity area. That cartilage structurally on it, TAC probably has a little bit of surface fibrillation, but not as focal defect. But clearly we can appreciate the fact that this radial zone is not as thick as it should be. 
on there. Likewise, with more chronic type cartilage lesions, we oftentimes end up with a very heterogeneous structure. We lose that normal, nice laminar appearance that we see on proteinesthesia in our MRI, and we end up with a heterogeneous appearance. Again, structurally, you know, a fairly good preservation of tissue within that joint, but were we to look at that underlying collagen matrix, we'd see that it's damaged, and it's been damaged for some time. We can see it in response to underlying uh, biomechanical overloading. Here's a patient that's had a rather significant lateral partial metastectomy. That lateral compartment of the knee is extremely dependent on an intact lateral meniscus. You remove that lateral meniscus, you can increase the loading forces 600 fold, 600 percent, I'm sorry, uh, 600 percent, particularly with that knee inflection. And we can see the impact of that overlying uh, load on that central portion of that tibial uh, plateau where most of those forces are being imparted. Similarly, we see it on the posterior aspect of that femoral condyle. So just the mechanics related to this partial metastectomy and the impact that it's having on the articular cartilage are demonstrated quite well with conventional MRI techniques. We can also see it in the setting of acute uh, injury. This was a 49-year-old female. She fell running, obviously tore her ACL, uh, but also impacted the cartilage within the lateral facet of her patella, where we have diffuse increased signal intensity. My experience when you follow these over time is that this never goes back to being normal. That intrinsic uh, impaction on that cartilage, although we call it a contusion, implying that it's a transient uh, process, uh, usually will have persistent T2 abnormalities that last for years, particularly down in the radial zone. The peripheral zone tendinally uh, resumes to a more normal signal intensity. Just some other examples, again, of cartilage contusion. This one, a 17-year-old female had a pain after a twisting injury, whether she had a transient patellar subluxation. Not be sure we don't see the impaction fracture, but we can see that altered uh, signal intensity within the cartilage of her lateral facet with an intact overlying uh, surface. Similarly, with chronic overloading, uh, such as excessive lateral pressure syndrome, we can see alterations in that collagen structure. We typically, we see increased signal intensity. Uh, this was a study that Wolfgang Grunder did uh, back about 15 years ago, where they looked at the comparison of the signal intensity on MRI with the polarization uh, with light microscopy and found that when you compress cartilage, you tend to buckle the radial zone, so you lose that anisotropic orientation of collagen that leads to an increase in signal intensity uh, due to the loss of that quadrupolar relaxation. And we can see that typically in patients with excessive lateral pressure syndrome. Well, oftentimes we'll see these focal areas in which we have T2 hyperintensity associated with a surface abnormality, a slight bubble. Sometimes our arthroscopists call this a cartilage blister. If we talk, go back to the outer bridge classification, that tends to be what they're talking about when they talk about softening of the cartilage, chondromalacia, patella, is this type of a lesion. Um, we're not sure if they progress or not. Here's an example one 18 months later where it did. He had this little hyperintensity, now has a full thickness fissure uh, within that medial patellar facet. Sometimes it, you'll see things in which you don't see high T2, but you see relatively low T2. And this one, I've never, this is about the only hypo-intense blister I've seen. Normally when I see hypo-intense cartilage, I'm thinking more of a chronic lesion, a chronic alteration in that collagen matrix. Uh, but here's one where we had it uh, as a blister effect. The other thing that we, we see are surf, uh, specific types of delamination type injuries that occur in response to the organization of that collagen matrix. Uh, particularly as patients get older, into their 50s or so, they begin to lose some of the function of that laminin splendens. They're no longer making the cartilage surface protein and lubricin that's responsible for keeping uh, decreasing shear force. So now with uh, load, you begin to get more shear force developing across the surface of that laminate splendens, and you can tend to get these delamination type tears that occur in that superficial zone of cartilage. And here's an example of uh, one again within the, the lateral facet that, that illustrates that. What you'll find typically over time is that that surface lesion tends to become lower in signal intensity. Um, partly because of the fact that when it's compressed, water no longer egresses simply into the articular space, but now has another pattern for egress back to this tear. That's one driver of the lower T2. The other effect is that over time, you now are compressing that collagen matrix, you're fragmenting that collagen, you're exposing more uh, sites for water binding, and you're increasing the amount of magnetization transfer that occurs in this area. So over time, you oftentimes can end up with these very low T2 signal intensity areas within that superficial flap. Kind of, we just tend to refer to it in our reading room as the black flap sign. Uh, this is a patient that you can tell has had it long standing, uh, although she's only 22 years old, uh, probably overloading of that lateral patellar facet from a patellar maltracking. We have fairly significant chondrosis within that lateral facet. Um, 
the delamination uh, type tear. So we can tell this cartilage is already damaged, but the structural drivers of that are re really related to the patellar maltracking uh, and the excessively tight lateral retinaculum. Another example now on a 47-year-old, she had anterior pain and some intermittent locking. Patients that have these type of flap tears sometimes will have symptoms similar to meniscal tears. They'll describe intermittent locking as that flap flips up and catches. Um, most of the time they're asymptomatic. In this case, this patient had some subchondral marrow edema, again has findings that would be suggestive of a lateral patellar, uh, excessive lateral patellar syndrome, uh, but has a marrow edema that may be the driver of, of her particular pain. And you can see these sometimes as well in femoral cartilage. We get these subtle T2 hypo intensities within the, the femoral cartilage that are indicative of an overlying superficial uh, delamination type tear. It's been described in the femoral trochlea. This was a paper published back in Skeletal Radiology down in 2011 that demonstrates this linear hypo intense fissure that typically occurs in every portion of the trochlea. This may or may not be a normal variant. I know in the equine orthopedic literature, they see this all the time in thoroughbred racehorses and call it normal. We see it in humans, we call it abnormal. Whether it's normal or abnormal really is not the uh, question. It's what is the significance of this finding in the clinical context of that individual patient. And oftentimes, we don't see significant progression of this particular uh, black line sign into a more uh, a larger chondral lesion. Here's just another example we see with uh, a patient has has a complex meniscal tear in the medial compartment, uh, but has this complex pattern of stellate hypo-intense fissures uh, within that uh, lateral tibial plateau. We, a couple things that we can use to infer that this is a chronic uh, process. One is that the T2 hypo-intensity uh, that we see typically occurs uh, with time uh, within the cartilage and otherwise also looking at the subchondral bone marrow edema. We no longer have that ill-defined edema that we typically associate with more acute type processes, but we can develop a very geographic bone marrow uh, edema type lesions and subchondral cysts related to uh, that chronic uh, process that's going on. So being able to understand the chronicity is also helpful in putting it in the clinical context. If this patient was presenting with a three-week history of pain, we can be relatively assured that this really has nothing to do with their symptoms. This is something that's been around uh, for months to years. There. So we want to be able to look at uh, identifying these lesions and trying to extract from that, playing a little more of the forensic pathologist, what's the underlying driver of those symptoms within this particular patient? What is the chronicity? What are the types of mechanisms of injury that would drive these types of cartilage lesions? And does it make sense in the clinical context of this particular patient's uh, presentation? The other where we, place where we see um, osteochondral injuries is at the bone cartilage interface. So this is just an expanded uh, schematic of that area of cartilage. If we look down at the radial zone of cartilage, remember it's perpendicular to the bone cartilage surface. Those uh, collagen fibrils will pass through the tide mark zone. They terminate within an area called the layer of calcified cartilage. And as a result, there's this potential area of delamination that can occur between the subchondral cortex and that calcified uh, cartilage layer. And we will see these delamination areas as linear areas of uh, typically T2 hyperintensity that occurred at that bone cartilage interface. This was a 28-year-old. He had surgery for a displaced meniscal tear, had an acute episode of trauma, and this was noted on his preoperative MRI. It looks like a relatively innocuous lesion, but I can tell you when they went in and probed that area, he actually had a full thickness fissure, and it was about a centimeter and a half of cartilage in that medial patellar facet that was delaminated off the bone and unstable, which was uh, resected and treated with a chondroplasty. So these oftentimes will underestimate the types of injuries that uh, they have. I think one of the important things when looking at that type of uh, lesion is trying to determine whether the overlying surface is intact or not. Oftentimes you will see these um, T2 hyperintensities at that bone cartilage interface, and this is a nice example in a 7T patella specimen, where you can see that, that linear area of T2 hyperintensity at the bone cartilage interface. That was really responsible for that is the fact that this patient kind of went underwent an in situ microfracture, where they fracture through that subchondral plate, they have an invasion of vascular tissue and hemorrhage that leads to conversion of hyaline cartilage into fibrocartilage. So these are probably structurally intact lesions. I mean, if you were to go in and resect those fissures, what typical treatment would be, you'd go in and you'd do a microfracture just like this in order to treat it. So when these surfaces are intact, um, I generally don't make, I think they have lower clinical significance. Unlike the prior study we saw, which was communicating with the overlying 
articular surface. I think those are uh, more indicative of unstable uh, chondral type lesions. Here's just a couple of different examples of chondral delamination here within the medial placet. This is a, one of our professional hockey players had intermittent pain. He's run to the boards a few too many times. You're going to get these types of uh, lesions. This again is one that you know, we see a little bit of hypo-intensity around the lesions, probably an acute on, on chronic type of a lesion, but the surface looks relatively intact. Uh, you can even see these with relatively poor, what I would consider poor quality uh, clinical scans. This was a 0.2 Tesla open uh, scanner, and you can see at least within the patella, uh, we can pick up these types of chondral delamination type injuries, uh, even with relatively poor resolution. Tibial femoral joint, I think it's much more difficult at lower field to be able to see them. Here's an example, uh, this is a 12 year old male, had one month of knee pain following injury playing a Wii dancing game. So you can see a uh, significant amount of chondral delamination in here. Now with pe the pediatric population, that delamination occurs along that secondary physis. That's where the weak area is in the osteochondral junction of the peds patient. When I see these types of things, kind of the important finding here is like, how does one generate enough force on their cartilage doing a wee dancing game that you delaminate your articular cartilage? I mean, that's just, just a head scratcher. How did that, that happen? And a lot of times in that adolescent group, you will begin to see patient populations in which they tend to have multiple areas of chondral delamination. I think when you see that, I start thinking about an underlying type 2 collagenopathy. Is there something intrinsic about this patient that puts them at risk for chondral delamination uh, type injuries? Because they tend to occur uh, over time. You might find them that they're occurring with relatively light amount of uh, loading. Uh, the type 2 collagen gene is one of the most variable genes within the human genome. There's not a lot of natural selective force on our type 2 collagen. The type 2 collagen we lay down uh, during skeletal development is the same type 2 collagen matrix we have when we go to the grave at age 80. There's very little turnover of that, of that cartilage. Uh, so one of the things that you can think of, the, kind of the sine qua non of this type of uh, lesion is the Stickler syndrome, in which there's an intrinsic uh, mutation within, and there's a family of mutations within the type 2 collagen le uh, uh, gene that leads to very premature onset of osteoarthritis. This is the proton density weighted sequence. You can see there's areas of, multiple areas of chondral delamination, significant cartilage loss, a dysmorphic contour of the the femur and tibia due to uh, abnormalities with enchondral ossification. These patients also have hearing problems, again, because of the enchondral ossification of the ossicles in the ear, and vision problems uh, because the vitreous humor is the other place where we see type 2 collagen expressed. We do a cartilage T2 map here. Here's just for a comparison, a heat map showing uh, the normal spatial variation of T2, uh, and then using that same scale, the stickler uh, so they have T2 values that could be two, three times higher than what we would see uh, with, uh, in a normal patient population. So that it's useful here in the fact that it shows that this is a very systematic, systemic process involving the type 2 collagen. So I have done occasionally T2 maps on these patients in which I suspect there's some underlying uh, type 2 uh, chondropathy collagen, op collagen path. Uh, and also have recommended they go on for other additional genetic testing. Not so much that there's a therapy for it, but it indicates a patient who at least is at risk for early onset of osteoarthritis. So we look at the role of conventional MRI in evaluating articular cartilage, I think we need to recognize that if we just do very high quality standard proton weighted images, we're going to pick up a lot of chondral lesions. That's not necessarily the problem. The problem is being able to understand which of those are significant and which ones can we put that information in the clinical context. And that's where the challenge comes uh, to us as the radiologists. I think a couple things that are very helpful to do that. One is that understanding the normal collagen matrix allows you to begin to pick up those early cartilage lesions. It allows you to understand some of the biomechanical forces that are driving uh, that pathology. It allows you to look at the chronicity. Is this an acute or a chronic process? All of that kind of secondary information is helpful when you're trying to put this in uh, the clinical context. And although we can pick up these lesions, I would say that diagnosis and detection of collagen problems is, that's not the issue. You know, I could diagnose collagen problems with a calendar. You know, if you're 60 years old, yeah, you've got early cartilage degeneration. That's not the issue. What the problem is that we want to be able to put that in context. And we want to be able to say, is this cartilage lesion contributing to the patient's symptoms? What is the prognosis of this cartilage lesion? And should this be a cartilage lesion that should be treated? i.e. the role of degeneric looking at the preoperative evaluation of the hip, I think is one where clearly it does add value. 
So if we were to conclude, and I would say one of the take-home messages I have is have us think about how does cartilage mapping at clinical value. Well, I'd say conventional techniques that we have already detect a large amount of preclinical disease that we really don't know what to do with. Uh, the patients, when they are presenting with advanced joint degeneration, are typically at that stage uh, where these techniques are no longer specific. That we're dealing now with a joint that's in the process of deterioration where I could look at you know, whether I look at degeneric, I look at T2 mapping, whether I look at T1 row mapping, they're down the pathway where these techniques are no longer uh, responsive in a linear fashion to disease progression. Uh, we can use them to increase our diagnostic certainty, but if that diagnostic certainty is not going to change treatment, it really doesn't add value. And the significance for a cartilage injury and its risk at progressing to OA progression is not dependent on the cartilage lesion itself. It's the joint that's degeneration. And we have to make sure that we're not chondrocentric and looking at cartilage in isolation, that we have to take in information about uh, the entire joint uh, when we're using this information. Thank you.